Thanks for coming, everybody. I'm Jim. We're very lucky that we've got four fantastic speakers. I'm, I feel so privileged and, 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 and so lucky. One of the reasons Leonard said that we should put on an event in London is because London played a key part at the, in the early days of the internet, and particularly this next gentleman, Peter Kirstein, CBE no less. And Peter's still a professor of computer science at, at, at UCL, who of course got departments uh, based here. Um, and Peter was the first person to put a computer on the ARPANET outside of the US in 1973, um, as well as other claims to fame. He was um, he's a key part of creating the Internet Protocol Suite, along with Vint Cerf and Bob Kahn, and implementing it in the mid-70s. The mid so we're going to show a short interview that Peter and I did together uh, last month, and then we're going to sit down with Peter and get some of his observations. We've got a friend of mine and an inspiration, Ava Pascoe, serial digital entrepreneur who um, set up the first internet cafe in London in 94, I think it was, set up a digital think tank, Cyber Salon, in 97, really early into e-commerce. She's going to be talking to us about the difference the web made when, it in, when, it, when the web became part of the internet landscape and a broader set of people came on board. We're finishing with Plexel's very own Saj Huck. He's the program director of Lorca, which is a cyber security research team here at, here at Plexel. He's going to be talking about the opportunities and challenges that total connectivity bring along, especially in the age of mistrust. So really looking forward to that. But we're starting off with Alan Kay, who's um, a personal computing pioneer and um, a bit of a legend. He's, he's best known for creating the Dynabook, which was a, a carry-all device, a personal computer for kids of all ages. That's kind of familiar. And he came up with this concept, this idea, in the late 60s while he was at the University of Utah. And he was actually there when Utah became the fourth node on, on, on the ARPANET. After the University of Utah, I believe, he went to work at, at Xerox, where there was a huge amount of pioneering breakthroughs. The Dynabook came to life in the, in the form of the Alto, but they, they created the Ethernet, they created laser printing, graphical user interface, object-orientated programming, modern computing as we know it. But what I think people don't necessarily realize is the overlap between the ARPA community and Xerox PARC. A lot of the graduate students that were, were sponsored by the ARPA project ended up finding jobs at, at Xerox PARC. And indeed, the leader of IPTO, the Information Processing Techniques Office at ARPA, Bob Taylor, ended up running Xerox PARC. So there's a, there's a big crossover, and it's almost like one, one community. Um, so Alan's going to be talking about the culture at Xerox PARC and, um, and the ARPA community that led to such a fantastic number of breakthroughs in such a short period of time. The other thing people might not know as well is that Alan is Tron. And um, after a, a kind of visit to Xerox Park, Bonnie McBride, the script writer of, of, of Tron, basically made Alan the, the, the main character. And here he is in action. And actually, if you watch Tron, for the, you know, the, the, the people who are familiar with the film, it's actually a metaphor for object-oriented programming. So watch it again with that, with that in mind. <laughs> and the main character, Tron, his actual username is Alan1, which was Alan's username at Xerox Park, I believe. But we're not talking, we're not here to talk about Tron, unfortunately, although I'd like to. Um, we're here to talk about the culture at, at, at Xerox Park and, and the ARPA community that led to such a huge amount of innovation in a short period of time and what we can learn from it. And on that note, I'm going to pass you over to our keynote speaker, Alan Kay. So, Jim. Uh, asked me if I could talk about the internet and also about ARPA and PARC, as he, as he mentioned, and could I do it in just a couple of minutes, please? And of course, my reaction was, well, OK. Um, so here it is in one second. Because <laughs> I actually like history. And this is the minimal, just for an exercise, I put down the minimal number of things that need to be talked about to, that got us to uh, the internet and personal computing. And of course, that's way too much. And this leads us to two ideas, which is 
This old fortune teller says, I tell the future, nothing easier. It hasn't happened yet, so you can say anything you want. And by the way, if you're feeling creative, that's a good way to start. Just tell a future you'd like to see happen, and then you can make it happen. But she also asks, who can tell the past? And the reason the past is hard to tell is it happened in real time across an entire world. And what it means is any kind of compression of that past is almost certainly going to leave out something important, including, as Goethe pointed out, most of the people who actually participated in making something happen. And this is why we don't, in, in my research community, we have superheroes. They're like most valuable players in sports. But in fact, it's uh, all of the stuff that we did was done by uh, teams of various size. And so we try not to claim this got invented first and that got invented first. It actually doesn't work very well. For instance, most people here may not know because in both, tele in both America and the United States, uh, uh, claim to have invented television. Most people don't know that the first image, television image ever put on a CRT was actually done in Japan in the early 20s by a Japanese guy. He understood what a CRT could be and made one that could show a television image. So having said that, we can start isolating different parts of this thing. For instance, this is the radar part of it, and British radar is on the left-hand side, and American radar is on the right-hand side. The key idea here is there are a couple of really important people. Henry Tizard was the most important person. If you want to know who was most directly responsible for this country not being lost in the Battle of Britain, it was Henry Tizard, because in the early 30s, he started worrying about Germany when Hitler came to power. He was a physicist, and he started poking at people, first looking for a death ray or a directed energy weapon, and the people he talked to said, well, that's too much power, but we might be able to detect planes coming. And so uh, the result of that was long before while Chamberlain was still appeasing and all of that, were a series of coastal stations all around the eastern part of this island, from the tip top of Scotland all the way down uh, the bottom. And when the German planes came over, they were detected, and they could scramble the RAF to take care of them, and Britain wound up uh, winning those battles. And radar also was the key technology for defeating submarines and night bombing. So it was the key technology that won the war for the Allies. And a lot of it happened here. The bosses of these two physicists let them do what they wanted, and they wound up inventing the cavity magnetron, which was the first electronic device that could actually put out enough power at a small enough wavelength to make uh, very uh, even de the detection of a periscope of a submarine possible. And Tizard, again, got together with Van Avar Bush in the United States. And Tizard convinced the British government that the secrets that Britain had, instead of being barded with the Americans, they should just give them all to us and expect that uh, goodwill and trustworthiness would take care of everything else. And he was completely right. So it just cut through an enormous amount of bullshit that you would see in almost any other time. And the magnetron was bought, brought to the United States, and that set up this enormous research and development effort at MIT that made almost all of the radars that were used in World War II, which were manufactured by American companies and distributed. And this was set up in part by having British scientists come over there. And there's one other little benefit at the very end of the, the war that Bush had been thinking about, how do you organize all of this stuff? And he thought everybody who dealt with knowledge should have a desk like this, a desk that holds the equivalent of 
maybe 10,000 books worth of stuff that has scanners, has pointing devices, has hyperlinks. This was called Memex. Does this look familiar today? <laughs> okay, so this is 1945, and many of the inventors of the stuff that we have today read what Bush wrote in 1945. So this is a direct, this is an image of something that everybody wanted to have, and people started looking to find out about it. Okay, British computing, Turing, of course, going all the way up to Babbage and Ada at the top, Bletchley Park, which they couldn't talk about, but in fact, the people at Bletchley Park remembered what they did, and that led to a number of computers, particularly the uh, Manchester computers. And the Brit Brits were way ahead of the Americans uh, during the late 50s and the early 60s. And unfortunately, you let IBM in, and they kind of bought out all the good stuff that was being done over here. And for, as part of our story, we could just as well, in 1969, and should be, celebrating Don Davies, uh, the National Physical Laboratory, network because that started working in 1969 also. And the people working on networking were friendly. Uh, the US got more of the credit than it deserved in a way because there are the resources to develop the stuff into the internet and make it larger. But intellectually, it was kind of an even Stephen thing. And there was a wonderful character by the name of Louis Poussin in France, who was also instrumental. And this, here's Peter. We'll hear from him a little bit later. He had a lot to do, and I'm hoping he will tell the VAT story. What Jim calls ARPA is basically open-ended government research in the public domain, most of which was ARPA. So this is a little bit too complicated to talk about. And Here's Xerox Park. He said a few words about that. Xerox Park was really a, an integral part of this community. Everybody at Xerox Park had gotten their PhDs paid for by ARPA, and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. And this whole thing started out because this one guy, Licklider, said early on, computers are destined to become interactive intellectual amplifiers for everyone universally networked worldwide. So he said that in 1962. And he got money from the government because they liked him. And he started all of these things happening. Now, if we look at just the network aspects here and combine the British and the American, we get something that's a bit like this, that in the 50s, there were uh, air defense systems done in the US that had displays and pointing devices on them. Licklider saw those and said what he just said. He decided to fund MIT to make a computing utility because this wartime system was the kind of thing that pretty much everybody could make use of. It was networked together. There were 25 different places. And that led Lick to say, well, we need an intergalactic network. We want to connect up everything. And that got the romance that turned into the internet started. And Len Kleinrock, never been called Leonard in his life, from New York. So it'd be Lenny. Uh, in California, he's called Len. Uh, he did some important early work uh, showing that you could queue messages without congestion. He did not invent packets, but his messages were, were like what packets uh, eventually came to be. And packets were invented more or less independently by Paul Barron and Don Davies, one in the US and one in the UK. And this led to two networks, the ARPANET and NPLNET. And as was mentioned, oh, then in a wonderful network called the LOANET, which dealt with the problem of how do you have the University of Hawaii work over all the islands back in the days when telephones were incredibly expensive. And the idea is, well, you broadcast it into the air. And Xerox PARC took that idea and made the ethernet because a coax cable is actually like what you broadcast radio. If you broadcast radio inside of a, 
of a cable, you can do something like a LOA net. And then, uh, as was mentioned, these two networks were connected for the first time in 1973 that Peter had a lot to do with. And then there are a lot of work on internetworking. What we're celebrating today actually is not internetworking. We're celebrating uh, a packet networking in both places. And uh, in, we can celebrate internetworking in a few years. But why not celebrate it now also? So there, Park it had its own internet, little known fact, and worked on it. And many people worked on it. And then there was the SRI bread truck. What is this doing here? And I'll show you right now. So in 1976, this is an outdoor beer garden near the Stanford campus out in the woods, still there, called Zotz, Rosati's. And in October, uh, <laughs> this bread truck, which inside had a couple of PDP-11s and radio transmitters, and it had a Mickey Mouse phone. And the reason they had this is so they could prove to the people in Washington that it was using standard telephone. So this is the, maybe the first uh, voice over IP. And the connection was radio net link into the Bay Area packet radio network going to SRI and then across the country on the ARPANET to the, to the East Coast. And why were they at this beer garden? Well, of course, so they could drink beer while doing their monthly report. So here they are with a teletype machine quaffing the golden liquid, trying to figure out what it is that they should tell to the government sponsors at the other end. I happened to be there for this, and everybody had a very merry time that day uh, because it all worked. So this is an early example of internetworking because it had to go through a bunch of different networks in order to get to Washington. And maybe the, the date we really celebrate as the start of the internet was the next year in 1977, which also involved the bread, bread truck. And it also involved uh, things that Peter did over here to connect up uh, several networks together by satellite. Well, there were these sponsors. So in the US, we have a Congress, and we have the Pentagon. And the Russians gave us a gift in 1957, which is to, to get Americans to do things for the only reason they do them, which is they were scared. <laughs> By the way, that's what happens over here. So if you are interested in why all this stuff happens at some times and not others, it's because regular people don't want to do anything with boffins unless they're terribly scared because they really don't want to deal with unusual people. It's only when there's a real threat of war that they start looking for unusual people to try and find more ways out of the dilemma. So Sputnik caused ARPA to be created. And in the 60s, the four ARPA directors were these guys. The first one of those funded uh, lick lighter over here, and then a line of uh, one guy every year, every two years through the 60s. And of course, Congress wasn't as bad as our Congress is now, but uh, you can uh, how is this relevant? Tell me why this work that you're doing at ARPA is relevant to the Department of Defense. Why are you spending this money? And what these guys would say, these guys are all scientists. They weren't administrators. These guys were all scientists. So what they would say is, oh, that's not the right question to ask. The right question to ask is, how is this going to help the United States or this technology or our society or our culture generally? That's the question. We'll, if you ask us those questions, we'll tell you. And Bob Taylor, who uh, was a bystander there, said the, these ARPA directors would stand up to these guys and in a polite, civilized way attack their myopia because these ARPA directors were scientific statesmen. And he says, we have had too few of these people in that job since then. And an example that's relevant to our story today is that in 66, Charlie Hertzfeld asked Bob, well, what do you want? And Bob said, well, this network is what I want to do, and here's why. 
And Hertzfeld said, okay, you got it. And that conversation was a 15-minute conversation. <laughs> and then Hertzfeld said, well, how much money do you need to get this thing going? And Bob said, well, about a million dollars, which is about uh, six million pounds today. If you give, give us six million pounds, uh, we'll, we'll get it organized and off the ground. And Hertzfeld said, okay. And Bob said, there was no ARPA order written or anything for months, maybe even a year. They just started doing it and started spending this money. That is how the internet got started. Imagine trying to do that today. Imagine how many reasonable people would be put in the path of progress. And when the Vietnam War started shutting this funding down, Taylor went to uh, find other funding, which he found at Xerox, and he set up Xerox Park. And so this is the lineage of the people who made our technologies today possible, not just the internet, but also personal computing. And if you want to read about this, there is a website, the website of this meeting that we have. And you can just go to internet at 50.com, and there's a link to the Alan K references. So I have downloadable stuff and references to read about this. Nobody should escape the next few months without reading about the Tizard mission of radar in this country. This is the book about ARPA and Xerox PARC. And, and there are some documents also on the website that are written at the time. For instance, one of the great books of all time is this book written in 1953 about British computing. So if you want to know what was going on in 1953, this book has papers by everybody who is important. It has a paper by Turing. It has a paper by uh, Christopher Strachey. It has papers by the Manchester people. It's got a paper in there by Maurice Wilkes, my old hero. Just a great thing. Um, I have to promise myself not to digress. So if you're interested in this stuff, go there and read this. OK, now I want to talk about the problem that most people have today in dealing with the past. It's not just the old fortune teller problem. The problem is, is that the words that we use today were used in different ways in the past. And so when we learn about something in the past, or when we see something in the past, we tend to evaluate it in terms of the present. And a good example of this, and a great complaint, what happened when Engelbart who is known as the inventor of the mouse and other things, died. Uh, the modern day Engelbart wrote a great obituary. And here's the most telling thing. He said, when I read tech writers' interviews with Engelbart, I imagine these writers interviewing George Orwell and asking in-depth probing questions about his typewriter. That's the problem. The mouse was nothing. It just happens to be visible. It's the invisible stuff that you have to look at. Similarly, the shopping list thing, well, yeah, it had hypertext, shared screen, collaboration, blah, blah, blah. And as Brett Victor says, the flaw is you don't want to treat the past as like today except cruder. That assumes that today is some refinement of the past. In fact, in many, many cases, what we have is a much cruder present from a much more refined past. And if we had more time, I would demonstrate this to you in ways that would astonish you. And the reason this is true is because Engelbart was special, and almost nobody who followed him was as special. So we got these special ideas early on from this genius. And Engelbart himself said, hey, the mouse, that's just a button on the radio. We invented a whole car. You're spending all this time worrying about some knob on the radio. OK, so the problem with invention and even innovation, which is a, just something incremental on something that's already known, is people don't even reinvent the wheel. They reinvent the flat tire. 
And if you don't know about wheels, this sort of works, right? Have you ever had a flat and had the drive on it? Anybody? <laughs> sort of works. And if you don't know about something better, you might think that's what a wheel is. Similarly, full glass of water holds a half glass. And so for the creature that's comfortable in the half glass, the creature can swim in that, but also has the opportunity to go up to the top there. But if you give, only give the half full glass out, that creature has no opportunity to explore the top and might start thinking that that's reality. So a very important thing to understand about today is that in many important respects, normal has been redefined downward. So the things we take to be normal today in many ways are just shadows of better ideas in the past. And of course, people are curious about, I went on the net to see if people were curious about Orwell's typewriter, and boy, they are. Here it is. And because it's so much easier to talk about a typewriter than it is to wonder what he meant by this. So we really want to ask, what was he trying to accomplish? How did he go about it? And eventually, we can get down to his typewriter. It actually is important. Printing is important. But we have to go for the top ideas. And similarly, in the mid-50s, we had these. There were 25 centers in the US, each one of which had about 150 of these interactive terminals with pointing devices. But you didn't realize that. And they were all networked together. Uh, what this turned into, by the way, was our uh, air traffic control system. It was developed directly from this. Back then, it was the air traffic control system for Ruf Russian bombers. And we want to do the same kind of thing. What were these people actually thinking about? Because that's the typewriter. We want to know what were they trying to accomplish? How were they able to make it happen? And eventually, you can get down to some questions about the technology. So just a quick sample here. We saw what Bush was interested in with something like a super version of Wikipedia. The head of ARPA wanted to keep track of everything. Licklider was more lofty. He saw that the combination of humans and computers would think together as no humans have ever thought before. McCarthy looked at it and said, every home will have one, one of these. Every home will have one, because they thought of this as an information utility, like our power utility, or our water utility, or gas utility. Ivan invented computer graphics, which is used today. And Engelbart wanted to deal with humans' capabilities for dealing with complex, urgent problems, like the climate problem, like education, like energy, like water. Engelbart was a very serious guy, and this is what he wanted to do. And in this short talk, I'll just look at two of these things. So here's a Licklider memo in 1963 to the members and affiliates of the Intergalactic Computer Network. They asked him, why do you call it intergalactic? And he said, well, engineers always give you the minimum. <laughs> and I want a worldwide network, so I'm asking for an intergalactic one. And he said, if we make an intergalactic ne network, then our main problem will be learning to communicate with aliens. And this is an important idea. It's an idea that hasn't been grappled with in today's commercialization of the technology. That once you scale up, the most points in a scaled up network are going to be alien to you in a variety of ways. And one of the papers I put online for you to read is this paper called The Computer as a Communications Device. You'll find it very interesting because it is almost absent from the communication devices you're using at this very moment. Almost no good ideas are in the uh, mobile phones that you have. So the, the key thing is if you can't share context, it's hard to agree on something. So if the subject is a mane and hooves and tail, one person could be thinking of a horse and another of a zebra. They might agree on a hamburger. 
if you're trying to communicate with a computer, what shared context could you possibly have? What could you do with its thought cloud to get it to intersect with yours? If it's an AI, these are all illustrations, by the way, from this paper back then, uh, and I've added a couple to them in the same style. So the salesman wants money. The computer is not too sure about what humans are, but knows to protect the boss. There's the problem of the chocolate and the apple, even inside our own heads. So we have this problem of humans and groups communicating with themselves to each other individually and groups as one example of alien problems. Once we add computers in, we've got the problems of human communicating with computers. That's the user interface problem. We've got the problem of different computers communicating with each other, both in hardware and software. That's half of what the internet tried to work on. And then we have real aliens that we should think about every once in a while. What does that mean? Now, important idea here is that one of the ways we help to communicate with ourselves and others is through media. And so we can put media on the computer. But as soon as we do, the biggest sin would be just to imitate the physical media that we've been using. That is the number one problem with these devices that you have. They are all conveniences for media that happened before. You know, they're all about movies. They're all about recordings. They're all about photographs. They're all about text. All the things that people have gotten used to that you can sell without a learning curve are in the normal of today. Almost everything that's important about computers has been left out of the normal. And so if you think that what you're doing is just normal reality, you're missing entirely what the computer is all about, and in fact, what these guys uh, were all about. So here they are collaborating on something important, like making a bridge, designing it, testing it. And this cartoon was taken from an actual meeting of the Engelbart group, because their system was so important to them, and the sharing was so deep in their system. For instance, no matter what you did in the Engelbart system, any number of people could get in there, and they each had their cursors. So it wasn't a sharing cursor. It wasn't just seeing a picture. You were actually all able to interact on the same uh, stuff and to communicate about it. They thought about what are tools. So here's a simple tool that goes right to something that's genetic in humans. If it doesn't work, bash it. So you, her goal, this is what Engelbart called an A process. And the B process is improving her A process. She's getting better at hitting these things. And an important thing to understand about tools is they actually train us while we're using them. She's thinking more and more hammer-like thoughts. As an adult, she might think of using a nuclear weapon on somebody. It's a natural thing. If people don't do what we want, hammer them. The favorite hammer of today is starting to be AI. So think about how dangerous this is to have a Pleistocene brain with nuclear weapons. Well, most people don't worry about this today, but these guys did. But there are also inward tools. So here's a tool that actually changes her perceptions. And again, we can use an agent, a servant, to do things for us. That gives us a view of the world. But we can also use an agent to help our internal growth, use a teacher. We can hammer people, affect people through teaming. But we can also put teams together to grow. So all of these things I'm telling you here were things that were thought about back then. And of course, what they thought about is what, with these modes of use, what if we replace parts of it with computers now? And what does that mean in terms of communication? What does that mean in terms of agencies? So if we take that idea and this Engelbart meeting, here's what they thought of, is that this diagram, which is the one that we have today, humans controlling powerful agencies, is not what you want. You have to include education, the thing that doesn't happen today. And with that, you can use new methods. You can use, use new languages, and you've created a system that includes the human. This is what Engelbart meant by augmentation. He didn't mean just adding a tool. And that system 
is kind of a thinking unit. And if you put together a group collaborating, you're putting together groups of these. So this is a big idea. Almost nobody uh, who reads about Engelbart reads far enough to understand that this is what they're driving at. I think this might help some of the discussions uh, uh, later on in this, in this meeting. OK, so I hate bullet lists. So I'll just mention a couple here. So why did this stuff work? Well, the funders funded visions, not goals. They didn't think they were wise enough to pick goals. What they wanted to do is to put out a vision and let people, different people, find different ways of realizing the vision. They didn't want to fund just problem solving, because if you make up a problem from the current context, it's probably not the problem you should put your work into. You need to find problems. They paid money for that. Fund people, not projects. The top people are the ones that are going to make a difference. Only fund the very best people because they're qualitatively different than the next levels down. And this is a long-term venture, so part of our research results have to be the next generation researchers. And ARPA was one of the few groups ever to build in a, a, a very large amount of money to create the next generation of researchers. Every researcher at Xerox Park had been created by ARPA. I was the oldest one there, and I was 30. Butler Lampson, who was the Oppenheimer of Park, was only 27. And Taylor at Park was only 38. So you need unusual people, but this is the least thing to worry about, because they're just way out in the bell curve. And if you have a couple of hundred million to to uh, choose from. If you want a championship football team, get Beckham. If you want Xerox Park, get Butler, Butler Lampson in this case. And who knows how rare they are. But if you need one in a million, there's going to be 200. If you need one in 10 million, there's going to be 20. You can find these people. Xerox Park was only 25 researchers, only 25. You can find them. The problem is you can't find the funders. So what did these guys look for? Well, they were just trying to get the best people who were interested in this and let them do their thing. The people you want to get also want to choose their own problems and methods, sure, because they're artists. They want to work on their own conceptions of the problems. Taylor said, my job is to organize things so that when the lone wolves need to cooperate, they will. And he was very successful at that. This man right here is my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, you hear the stories, it's... I'm living a dream. So, the important thing about this is, this is the way management thinks about dealing with these top researchers. It's completely wrong. 100% wrong. Couldn't be more wrong if you tried. But the only thing, they, they think that their job is actually to manage, to control. And you can't control cats. But here's a much younger set of research funders who really understand. We have a jar filling all the names of the toys we have sitting right next to us. And we're going to take from the jar one by one and open up these toys. All right. Would you like to go first, picking something from the jar? Yes. All right. What is Mouse it? on a spring. Ooh, I like this one. All right. Me though. Mouse on a spring. It's inside this box right here. So there's this little mouse on a spring, and it's going up and down, and our cats are going to try to catch it. All righty. Our cats really like having mouses, but they keep on tearing them apart because they're kind of vicious. So we got another one. OK, I got it. And this is the toy. It's a little mouse. It goes on a spring. Like George is already into the toy. He's like, what is this? What is this mysterious item? George. So easy if you actually understand who you're dealing with. 
So here's why this stuff worked. This is the number one reason here. It's because a great vision is not a set of goals. A vision has to be nonspecific enough. It has to be romantic, but it has to be something that can be filled in by the people who hear the vision. And Licklighter's, as I mentioned, was computers are destined to become interactive intellectual amplifiers for everyone universally networked worldwide. He tied that to a magnet, and he hit it over the horizon. And it attracted hundreds of iron particles in different places. They all pointed to north. They didn't know what north was, and neither did Licklider. But they all got to north. So the number one principle here is the goodness of the results correlates most strongly with the goodness of the funders. Thank you. <laughs>